Some say power is always dangerous. It attracts the worst and corrupts the best. Others believe power doesn't corrupt people. People corrupt power. So is knowledge power or is power simply power? Is it money, thoughts, or creativity? We don't truly know what power is. Perhaps it's an illusion, but one thing is certain. The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Power dynamics are at play everywhere, from boardrooms to battlefields. And today we're diving into how game theory decodes these dynamics. <laughs> All right. In game theory, power dynamics are a central focus. The players in any game, be it political, social, or economic, strategize to maximize their gains and minimize their losses. Power in this context is a resource, a leverage point. It's the ability to influence outcomes, shape strategies, and dictate terms. Game theory teaches us that power is not just about dominance or control. It's about strategies, perception, and the ability to influence outcomes. Understanding this can help individuals and groups navigate complex social dynamics, make informed decisions, and ultimately, reclaim the power they might not realize they possess. But wait, what kind of power are we talking about? In game theory, several types of power come into play. There's positional power, which derives from one's formal position or role within a structure or organization. This type of power is often associated with authority and control over resources or decision-making processes. Then there's informational power, which stems from possessing valuable information or knowledge that others lack. In game theory, players who possess more accurate or timely information often have a strategic advantage, influencing outcomes through their insights. For example, a trader, detective, or negotiator who can change the outcome of deal. There's also relational power, which emerges from interpersonal relationships and networks. Think of a political campaign where a candidate builds strong alliances with influential community leaders. These connections provide relational power, helping the candidate mobilize support and sway voter opinions. Moreover, there's psychological power, which relates to perception and influence over others' beliefs, emotions, or motivations. This type of power can shape behavior and decisions through persuasion, manipulation, or the ability to inspire and motivate. Think of an influencer or charismatic leader or the Hitler. Each type of power interacts dynamically within game theory scenarios affecting how players strategize, negotiate, and ultimately achieve outcomes. Now, picture this. Three of the most powerful people in the world are in a room together. A pope, a billionaire tycoon, and a country's president. And standing between them is a common guy, a sellsword armed with a blade and waiting for instructions. Each of these powerhouses bids the sellsword to kill the other two. Now tell me who lives and who dies. Who holds the most power here? Is it money or faith or influence? Or is it the sellsword? Because he has the power to give life and death? Maybe it's none of these. Maybe the real power lies in the perception of power. The sellsword has the immediate power to kill. But why do we believe the king, or in this case, any of the three great men holds all the power? Wait a minute, is this starting to sound like a scene from Game of Thrones? All right, I know where this is going. You see, power resides where people believe it resides. It's a trick, a shadow on the wall. The sellsword's power is real but fleeting. The king, the pope, the tycoon, they all hold power because people believe they do. It's all about perception. When we stop believing in their power, it disappears. So in the end, who holds the most power? Is it the one with the sword? The one with the gold? The one with faith? Or the one with influence? Perhaps the real power lies in understanding that control is an illusion, a game we all play. And that, my friends, is the true nature of power. Without the sellsword's compliance, their power plays fall apart. The president's promises are empty without someone to act on them. The Pope's absolution means nothing without believers. The tycoon's wealth is useless without people willing to kill for it. In that moment, the power dynamics shift entirely. In game theory, we analyze situations where players make decisions that are interdependent, often trying to anticipate the moves of others to maximize their own payoff. Here, the sellsword, 
the president, the pope, and the tycoon are all players in a high-stakes game where power and survival are the ultimate prizes. The president's strategy is to leverage positional power to offer long-term gains. The pope's strategy, use rational power to appeal to the sellsort's conscience and promise spiritual rewards. The tycoon's strategy is to offer economic power with immediate, tangible benefits. Now the sellsort stands at the crossroads. He must weigh these offers against his understanding of power dynamics and future implications. This is where game theory really comes into play. A dominant strategy for the sellsword might be to take the offer that gives him the highest immediate payoff, assuming he's purely self-interested. But things aren't that simple. There's also the concept of Nash equilibrium to consider. If the sellsword's decision leaves the remaining player with no better option than to accept their fate, that's a kind of balance. But if he does that, he is merely a pawn in the game and future power dynamics are not in his favor. And if he views this scenario as part of a larger ongoing game, an iterated game, he might choose to avoid making enemies who could seek revenge later. His actions now will shape his reputation and affect future power dynamics. So, who lives and who dies? The sellsword makes his decision. He looks each powerful figure in the eye, then, without a word, lowers his blade and walks away. By refusing to play their game, he changes the rules entirely. He demonstrates that true power isn't just in titles, wealth, or spiritual authority. It's in the choices we make and the ability to disrupt expectations. Now, in game theory, strategies are like tools in a toolbox, each designed to handle different scenarios where players are making decisions that affect each other. Here are a few more tactics. First, tit-for-tat strategy. The strategy starts with cooperation and then mirrors the opponent's previous move. Imagine the sellsword initially cooperating with one powerful figure, in this case the president, expecting the same in return. Next, we have minimax strategy. This is all about minimizing the maximum potential loss. In power dynamics, the sellsword might choose the option that poses the least risk to himself, focusing on self-preservation in a high-stakes environment. His risk of negative consequences is lower compared to others, as he offers peace, absolution, and spiritual rewards. By minimizing the potential harm or backlash, he aims to convince the sellsword that his choice is morally and spiritually justified. Then there is game of negotiation. The sellsword could bargain with each powerful figure, trying to get the best deal before committing. It's about maximizing gains and minimizing losses through skillful negotiation. The business tycoon, driven by economic power, would engage in bargaining. He offers immediate tangible benefits such as wealth or luxury, negotiating for the sell sword's loyalty. His strategy focuses on maximizing his gains through strategic concessions and persuasive offers that appeal to the sell sword's desire for material gain and tan. Next, the game of chicken. This is like a high stakes standoff where each player risks a catastrophic outcome to force the other to yield. The sell sword might manipulate the powerful figures into a deadlock where no one wants to make the first move for fear of retaliation. He risks confrontation with all three powerful figures, pushing them to see who blinks first. Either he can cut the throat of each of them or can simply walk away. By creating a standoff where each powerful figure fears his potential retaliation, he seeks to maximize his leverage and control over the outcome. These tactics show how to make decisions that fit the power dynamics and tricky interactions with finesse. Game theory helps you figure out the best strategies by looking at what motivates each player and what risks they face. True power is not about controlling others, but mastering yourself amidst chaos. And that's where game theory comes into play. It's not just about predicting moves or outsmarting opponents in a calculated manner. Game theory teaches us to understand the strategic landscape of power dynamics against the backdrop of chaos, where resilience is the currency of the powerful. They prepare to engage in the ultimate game of strategy and survival. Each understands that in this game, mastery of game theory is not just an advantage, 
It's the difference between triumph and defeat. So, let the game begin.